By the end of 1934, prior to the formal announcement of the Luftwaffe's establishment, Germany possessed fewer than 600 combat-ready frontline aircraft. Among them, 30% were single-engine fighters, and over the next six years, a compact yet robust aircraft, the Messerschmitt Bf 109, would serve as the cornerstone of the German fighter fleet. This legendary machine remained in continuous action from 1939 to 1945, and in doing so it shot down twice as many aircraft as any other fighter in history. The Messerschmitt Bf 109 saw action in all theaters of war, and in the initial two years of the conflict, it virtually single-handedly decimated the majority of European air forces. With a production exceeding 33,000 units, the 109 emerged as the most prolific fighter aircraft of the Second World War and ranked as the second most abundant aircraft in the annals of military aviation. Over a 10-year period, a total of nine main variants and nearly 80 sub-variants were produced. Ongoing enhancements ensured that the aircraft maintained its formidable combat capabilities right up until the conclusion of hostilities. Even with the introduction of the exceptional Focke-Wulf 190, the Bf 109 remained the German aircraft destined for unparalleled fame, solidifying its status as the most renowned aircraft ever constructed in Germany. The story of the Bf 109 began in 1933, when the German Air Ministry initiated a competition to seek a replacement for their current biplane fighter, the Heinkel HE-51, as a new frontline aircraft. The tactical requirements for the RLM specified a single-engine, single-seat pursuit fighter to be developed and made ready for evaluation by the end of 1935. The new aircraft was required to be equipped with two fixed machine guns and had the capability to reach speeds of up to 400 km per hour. Development contracts were placed with four of Germany's leading manufacturers, Arado, Heinkel, Focke-Wulf, and Bayerisch Flugzeugwerke. Each produced its own design and after a series of evaluation trials, Willy Messerschmitt Bf 109 was chosen to become Germany's standard frontline fighter. Meanwhile, in England, two new British aircraft had conducted their inaugural flights, the Supermarine Spitfire and the Hawker Hurricane. Since both fighters were armed with eight Browning machine guns, the RLM decided to increase the armament of the 109. An additional weapon, firing through the propeller hub, supplemented by the two existing nose-mounted machine guns. In December 1936, the first batch of 109s were sent to Spain, where they were tested in combat by the Luftwaffe's Condor Legion. They achieved immediate success, demonstrating their superiority over all other aircraft in the Spanish Civil War during the initial two months of combat. Made up of volunteer pilots, the Condor Legion fought on the side of Franco's nationalist forces. Anolf Gallant, who would later emerge as an exceptional fighter ace with 104 victories and became Germany's youngest general, experienced his first combat in Spain. I flew the Heinkel 51 uh, biplane. But this was uh, at the time already an obsolete fighter. And therefore, we used it only for direct support, strafing, and uh, bombing. The Spanish Civil War marked the end of the biplane era and the dawn of the monoplane fighter. The concept of a cantilever aircraft with enclosed cockpits was entirely novel, leading experienced pilots to view the new Messerschmitt with a degree of skepticism. A fighter pilot in a closed cockpit is an impossible thing because you should smell the enemy. And you could smell them because of the oil they were burning. <laughs> Back in Germany, the first available 109s were delivered to the first and second routes of the Richthofen fighter wing. As the 109 pilots gained experience, they began to develop a new and more effective fighter tactic known as the Schwab. A quartet of flying aircraft in a loose formation were considerably less susceptible to attacks compared to the conventional grouping methods. Employing a formation pattern reminiscent of the splayed fingers of an outstretched hand, 
Each fighter within the Schwab formation offered protection from the one position behind it, ensuring that all four aircraft enjoyed optimal visibility. In my view, one drawback was the placement of the undercarriage near the canopy. Occasionally, especially for inexperienced pilots, this configuration could cause the aircraft to veer to the left during takeoff. We had many accidents because of this. In comparing the 109 to the FW190, its undercarriage was on the wings. There was a wider span. Dealing with the Messerschmitt on uneven surfaces posed an extremely perilous challenge, often resulting in trainee pilots losing their lives during the inaugural fights. One problem was, especially for inexperienced pilots, when taking off, insufficient attention to acceleration as the tail lifted and the propeller began to turn could often lead to the aircraft veering to the left. Once that happened, there was nothing you could do at all. It was a major problem, and it happened quite frequently. On numerous occasions when pilots had completed extended missions, returned from a day of combat, and were called back for another mission during takeoff, the aircraft would veer off course, crashing directly into the barracks. This happened many times. By 1938, a European war was inevitable, and German rearmament continued apace. 109 production expanded dramatically, and by the end of July 6th, more fighter groups had been re-equipped. In October, the initial highly productive variant emerged, powered by the Daimler-Benz engine, known as the BF-109E. Known as the Emil, it had a maximum speed of 570 km per hour. It was armed with either two machine guns and two cannons, or four machine guns and one cannon. On September 1, 1939, Germany invaded Poland, and 209 spearheaded the attack. The Polish Air Force found itself severely overmatched, and within a month of the invasion, it had suffered the loss of over 200 frontline aircraft. It's difficult to say that there were significant differences between the Messerschmitt and other aircrafts. They were very much the same. The difference, more or less, was due to the pilot's competence. You may not know and the ME-109 was not a very large fighter plane. In fact, it was one of the smallest planes. It was a single-seater, flexible, fast aircraft designed to hunt down enemy aircraft. That was the main role of the ME-109. The Luftwaffe casualties in Poland included 67 ME-109s, but most of these were lost to ground fire. The first clash between the new German fighter and the Royal Air Force came on September the 3rd at Polensbuten. Two Wellingtons from the number 3 group were shot down whilst making an attack on the German battlecruisers Scharnhorst and Gneisenau. On September 13th, 109 successfully eliminated five additional Wellingtons in an attack on the cruisers Leipzig and Nuremberg. Five days later, a separate formation of 24 Wellingtons from squadrons 9, 37, and 149 embarked on a reconnaissance mission over Wilhelmshaven and Schillig Roads. Intercepted by ME 109s and 110 destroyers, 10 of the British machines were shot down, and another three were badly damaged. It was much the same story when Hitler invaded France and the Low Countries in May 1940. Holland, Belgium, and Luxembourg were all defeated in quick succession, and the French Armée de l'Air was no match for the Luftwaffe in either organization or equipment. Sixteen fighter groups with more than 1,000 BF 109s were deployed in support of German advance. In less than a week, France had lost more than three-fourths of its total fighter strength. Despite the dispatch of a limited number of hurricane squadrons by Britain to provide assistance, their presence was too insufficient to significantly impede the tide. On May 23rd, 109s engaged in combat with RAF Spitfires, 
marking the first instance when German pilots confronted substantial opposition. No, I would like to say, and many pilots who went on missions will agree, that at the end of the day, it was very much to do with who is sitting at the stick. Es kam immer auf den Mann an der we experienced that during the Battle of Britain, British pilots shot down German pilots and vice versa. It all depends on the pilot. What sort of trainings he had received, how good he was. Was he faster than his counterpart? That was the problem. But the Spitfire would remain a deadly enemy, plaguing the 109 throughout the whole of its career. As the Germans advanced through France, RAF Spitfire and Hurricane Squadrons provided air cover for the British Expeditionary Force during its retreat to Dunkirk. <laughs> Commander Douglas Bada, who had re-enlisted in the RAF after losing both legs in a 1931 air crash, encountered 109s over the channel during the Dunkirk evacuation. I shot one fellow down at Dunkirk. He was, must have been a beginner like myself because he stayed flying absolutely straight and level while I shot him down, you know, without moving. We didn't have air superiority, that's, uh, so, but we had enough. The Germans had left Dunkirk and went on to, to Paris and so on, which was a great mistake of theirs, really. We lost quite a lot of airplanes at Dunkirk and some jolly good pilots. But uh, they managed to get back quite 300,000 men, I think, from the beaches. There's a lot of people. They actually dead calm sea. Nonetheless, despite the successful evacuation, by the end of June, the RAF had incurred the loss of more than 500 fighters. France had capitulated, and Germany had achieved complete air supremacy over Western Europe. While the Luftwaffe regrouped for the invasion of Britain, a number of improvements were made to the ME 109E. Wing-mounted machine guns were abandoned in favor of the MGFF cannon, and power output was increased by using the new Daimler-Benz 601N engine. Armor plating was added to both pilot's seat and the canopy area immediately behind his head. In an effort to increase the operational range, provision was made for 300-liter drop tanks to be carried externally. Fighter-bomber variants were modified to carry either a single 250-kilogram bomb or two 450-kilogram bombs using a fuselage-mounted rack. The 109E compared well with the contemporary Spitfire, but nevertheless, it had its shortcomings. Robert Stanford Tuck, an RAF ace who got his first killer Dunkirk, had experience of a meal. I flew the first one we captured in 1940 at Farnborough, which is a test establishment of ours, as you know. And we did a comparison trial between this first Messerschmitt and uh, an E, Messerschmitt E, and a Spitfire Mark II. They were very comparable in their performance, but I thought the 109 going downhill fast was very stiff on control. There was too much metal strutting and reinforcing around, which restricts your vision very, very much. By the summer of 1940, more than two and a half thousand German aircraft were ready to attack Great Britain. Based in France, the Low Countries, they began the main assault on August the 13th. With the aim of achieving air superiority, the Luftwaffe's bombers targeted airfields and radar stations across the entire southeastern region of England. They caused extensive damage, and on the first day alone, the RAF lost nearly 60 aircraft on the ground. During the opening phase of the battle, the German bombers were escorted by twin-engine BF-110s. They were hopelessly inadequate, and before long, 109 fighter units were being assigned to protect both the bombers and their escorts. Messerschmitt BF-110 proved to be a mistake, as both Douglas Bada and Adolf Gallant would later testify. The Germans thought it was very good. Actually, it was an absolute gift for a, a single-engine fighter. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think the Lightning was uh, an equal mistake. I mean, the P-38 P pilots uh, are angry with me about this state in town. But the BF-110 is not the only problem for the Luftwaffe. The 109E variant had a restricted range of just 400 miles. 
and his operational time in the skies over England amounted to slightly more than 15 minutes. No longer able to function independently, its effectiveness against the British fighters was greatly reduced. In the initial week of September, Goering altered his tactics by shifting focus away from attacking Britain's airfields and instead concentrating on the city of London. The RAF was granted a respite, and on September 15th, Fighter Command managed to assemble a force of 300 fighters to intercept the most extensive bombing raid of the battle. In the ensuing Malheur, Spitfires and Hurricanes outnumbered the 109s by a ratio of 2 to 1, and as a result, 60 German aircraft were destroyed. After two and a half months of continuous fighting, it was a demoralizing blow. In spite of all their efforts, the Luftwaffe had failed to knock out the radar system or to suppress the RAF. Within 48 hours of September the 15th, Hitler had postponed the invasion of Britain indefinitely. As the battle eventually concluded in late October, Germany's losses amounted to over 1,700 aircraft, which included 610 BF 109s. In April 1941, Hitler attacked Yugoslavia and Greece. As the war spread to Africa and the Middle East, the 109 was specifically adapted in order to cope with the predominantly dusty conditions. To minimize engine damage, a sand filter was fitted over the supercharger air intake, and the resulting tropicalized version was designated the BF-109 Trop. In June 1941, Germany launched Operation Barbarossa in the invasion of Russia. The opening attack was supported by 450 BF-109s. While a third of these aircraft were E-variants, the rest of the force was made up of the latest 109 model, the Friedrich. The F incorporated a number of improvements, many of which resulted from the experience gained in the Battle of Brittany. The inclusion of a larger propeller spinner and a revamped engine cowling minimized air resistance and bestowed the aircraft with a significantly sleeker appearance. The incorporation of rounded wingtips and the elimination of tailplane support struts enhanced its performance and increased its operational ceiling compared to the Emil variant. In the initial two days of Operation Barbarossa, the Luftwaffe's 109Es and Fs successfully downed over 300 Russian aircraft. Hundreds more were destroyed on the ground in a series of well-timed attacks on Soviet airfields. By the end of the month, German pilots have claimed more than 4,000 Russian aircraft, for the loss of only 150 of their own. Yes, I can remember all of my battles. These are memories one never forgets. I had 22 confirmed hits. I can remember various situations. One was on September the 15th in Riga. I shot down four aircraft in one day. One plane in the morning, and another three in the afternoon, all in one go. It happened within minutes. I would say that as a pilot, you have to have good reflexes and a good overall view of what's going on up there. Meanwhile, on the Western Front, the Supermarine Spitfire was keeping pace with the development of the 109. Although it was much less maneuverable, the 109F could outperform both the Spitfire Mark I and II. But in the spring of 1941, the Spitfire Mark V made its first appearance. Equipped with a new and more powerful Rolls-Royce engine, it was an immediate success, and as soon as it arrived in squadron strength, the balance between the Spitfire and the BF-109 was quickly restored. It was a question of who had the most powerful engine. The stronger the engine, the better the airplane. That was a handicap with our planes. We always had weaker engines than the English, and therefore slower planes. For the RAF, the Spitfire Mark V proved an equality that was very short-lived. Later in the same year, the Luftwaffe took the lead once more with the introduction of the radial engine Focke-Wolf 190. Known as the Butcher Bird, it could outclimb and outdive any opposing fighter. And in a dogfight with a Spitfire Mark V, it could engage and disengage almost at will. 
The Focke Wolf had a very powerful engine, and in itself was a very robust, well-built machine. It could cope very well with being shot at, probably more than the ME-109. The Focke Wolf had an air-cooled engine, and the ME-109A liquid-cooled engine, which meant that should any shrapnel cause damage to the cooling system of the liquid-cooled engine, then the battle would be over, whereas with the Focke Wolf, with its air-cooled engine, would continue. Willie Messerschmitt's fabled BF-109 was manufactured in greater numbers than any other production aircraft. Almost 34,000 were built. Usually referred to as the ME-109, at the time the aircraft was conceived, it was designated the BF-109. B because the maker was located in Bavaria, and F because the company was called Flugwerk. It was only when Willy Messerschmitt gained full control of the company that the ME prefix was assigned. Throughout the 30s and during the Second World War, Willy Messerschmitt endured a dogged relationship with Erhard Milch, who had gained high position with the fledgling state airline Lufthansa and later with the German Air Ministry, more often known as the RLM. A close friend of Milch was killed piloting a Messerschmitt-designed transport plane, the M20, on its first flight. Milch was to blame Messerschmitt over the accident, a grudge that was to last for years. Fortunately, Messerschmitt had cultivated a relationship with Hermann Göring, who ultimately became Milch's superior. To get his first Luftwaffe fighter contract, Messerschmitt's BF-109 had to compete with an advanced Heinkel design, the HE-112. There's no question the Heinkel aircraft was the better looking aircraft. But, um, I, and incidentally, they, when it came to the test pilots at Rechlin, they gave the 112 the better report, considerably better, over the 109. But Odette decided that he was under pressure to produce numbers of aircraft rather than quality. And he realized, quite rightly, that the 109 was far easier to produce in numbers than the 112, basically because the undercarriage on the 109 was an integral part of the fuselage, so the fuselage and the wings could be produced separately and then joined at a later date. In the end, the competition was won by the 109 and a legend was born. The 109 first saw service in Spain. Along with other modern German aircraft like the Stuka, the 109 was tested in actual combat conditions. The lessons gained would later be applied to a much larger conflict in the skies over Britain. In Spain, it became clear that the 109 lacked range and endurance. Its slender lines made for greater speed, but left little space for fuel. One possible solution to this problem was to use the BF-110 to tow the smaller 109 to the combat area, thus preserving its limited fuel for fighting. Novel though the idea was, the towing technique proved impractical for all but glider warfare. However, a few years later, when Germany was suffering from the relentless heavy bombing of the US 8th Air Force, the 109 was employed as a test aircraft in towing a unique glider fighter concept offered by the Bloom and Voss company. The BV-40 was a very low-cost fighter glider that would have been coupled to a BF-109. When the tiny Bloom and Voss design was in a position above the American bombers, it was released to attack them, using its two 30mm cannons and their limited stock of ammunition. 
The BV-40 was so small, its pilot had to lie on a mattress in a prone position. However, the BV-40 relied upon its diminutive size to avoid US gunners. Only seven BV-40s were built before the project was abandoned, probably because the ME-163 was a slightly more practical and self-contained concept. 109s were also pressed into service for clandestine missions, dropping spies and saboteurs behind enemy lines. Special capsules could be attached to both wings, each containing a single parachutist. An often overlooked feature of the 109 was its system of leading edge slats on the forward surface of the wings. These made for better handling and shorter takeoffs. Interestingly, the concept had been developed and patented by the British Hanley Page Company, and Messerschmitt had to pay for the use of the invention. The slats proved so successful that they were also used in Messerschmitt's 410 and legendary 262 jet fighter. The 262 had another link to the BF-109 owing to the fact that the jet's nose wheel assembly is actually a single main wheel strut from the BF-109's narrow gate undercarriage. The 109's narrow gate undercarriage was always a challenge when it came to landing or takeoff even under normal conditions. At one point in the war, the Kriegsmarine had high hopes for its sole aircraft carrier, the Zeppelin. It was always assumed that the Zeppelin would be equipped with Stukas and 109s. The Stukas wide gate undercarriage would have been suitable for aircraft carrier landings, but the standard 109 arrangement was not. Accordingly, Messerschmitt set to work to modify the wings so that the wheels could function in a more stable, wide-gate fashion. This aircraft was designated the ME-155. The Zeppelin never put to sea, and the 155 was abandoned, only to be later resurrected by the Blum & Voss company as a very high-altitude fighter concept. But this came too late to help an ailing Germany. Messerschmitt followed the 109 with the BF-110. Although this later became successful in several other roles, it was never suitable for the long-range bomber escort mission. Messerschmitt quickly offered the 210 as an alternative. But this proved to be a failure, and so the ME-410 was rushed into development. As a precaution, in 1942, the company was ordered to develop a backup aircraft based on existing 109 parts and using two fuselages, which enabled the creation of a totally new aircraft employing a minimum number of new parts. The ME-109Z Zilling was made as a single-seat, very long-range, heavy fighter. It might have shown great promise if the two prototypes had not been badly damaged in an Allied bombing raid. This loss demonstrated that Germany needed a homeland defender more than a bomber escort at this stage of the war. In addition, the ME-262 jet was close to delivery, and this groundbreaking design could have been a real game-changer if they had arrived in time. Possible proof of the ME-109Z's viability came with the US North American P-82 twin Mustang. Independently, the German designer of the P-82 chose to follow exactly the same approach as the ME-109Z. 270 twin Mustangs were actually produced and served in Korea and the United States as night fighters. In another pairing, BF-109s were flown with other aircraft during the Mistral missions. These occurred when Germany's fortunes were declining and the Wehrmacht were looking to develop a new type of flying bomb. The concept would use a disposable unmanned bomber 
filled with explosives, but guided by a piloted 109. Gliders were first used to prove this concept, but eventually two-engine bombers were employed. The BF-109 was produced in greater numbers than any aircraft in history. It served the Luftwaffe and other air forces well, and it proved more than an adequate fighter for Germany until it was supplanted by the FW-190. Even then, it remained in active service and production until the end of the war. The BF-109 was one of aviation's great planes. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.